right. Yeah. Man, it is great to see you this morning. Man, thanks for being at the Edge Church today. We are continuing the series that we started a few weeks ago called Be Strong and Courageous. And, you know, God wants us to live lives that are able to bounce back from the adversity that we face. Many of us are facing times of discouragement, times of adversity, times of disappointment, times of just struggle and heartache. And the question is, how do we bounce back from the hardships of life and get back in the game to live the life that God wants us to live? Unfortunately for many people, when we face trouble and hardship, difficulties, what we do is we... We just kind of lay on the ground like a big plastic blob. We don't have any bounce in our step. God wants us to begin to be bounce back believers. And bounce back believers are people that are inflated by the power and the presence of God. So God takes our deflated lives. And as we begin to focus on His Word and His Spirit, God begins to inflate our lives so that we can begin to bounce back from whatever's going on in our lives. And God's desire is not for us to live flat, fizzled lives, but to be that bounce-back believer that is full of faith, that is full of fight, that is full of fortitude, and ready to face whatever is before us. Like this. That's the life that God wants us to live. A bounce-back life. And that bounce-back life we see in Joshua chapter 8. Now, I love the story of the battle of Ai because last week we looked at the first battle of Ai. Today we're going to look at the second battle of Ai. And in chapter 8, we find a far different story than chapter 7 because it was in chapter 7 that Achan sinned against God and the people lost. But now in chapter 8, they're going to go back and fight the same battle, the same place, but they're going to do so with a different spirit and with a different attitude. Let me invite you to go to Joshua chapter 8. You can follow along with where we're going today. Because when sin is dealt with, then we can move on into victory. We can begin to have this bounce back type of faith that God wants us to have. The first battle of Ai was a mess. It was a defeat. It was embarrassing. Now in chapter 8, the same people are going to go back and fight in the same place, but they're going to do so and have a far different outcome. And I love this part because it's so inspiring. Chapter 8 really is a picture of our everyday lives. How do we bounce back from adversity? How do we bounce back from a marriage that is is failing? How do we bounce back from losses in business? How do we bounce back from mistakes that we've made in our lives? How do we get back in the game? How do we begin to go back and learn from where we've come from and to become the people that God wants us to become. John Maxwell calls it failing forward. Failing forward, he says, is when you make mistakes in your life, but you learn from them, and you go on, and you make changes for the future. Now we have this idea in our own minds that we should live lives that are without mistakes. Sometimes we are afraid. Oh, what if I mess up? What if I make a mistake? What if I don't do something right? But did you know that's just a normal part of life? That's going to happen to every single person. That's going to happen in every single uh, aspect of our life. We're going to have struggles. We're going to say some things we should not have said. We're going to go some places we wish we'd have never gone. We're going to have done some things that we wish we'd have never done. But the question is, in relation to our success, is are we going to learn from our mistakes and are we going to continue to repeat them? Are we going to go forward and do something differently? In Joshua chapter 8, the people have made a decision they're not going to stay where they are. They dealt with the sin of Achan, and now they're ready to go on into victory. And by the way, the reason that we need to deal with sin is because it will rob us from our future. Joshua confronts Achan. Achan is punished. It's dealt with. And then chapter 8, we find the victory. But a lot of times what we want to do is we want to run from the problems we want to ignore the problems and hope that they'll just go away some, in some mysterious fashion and, and we don't really deal with it. Chapter 7, the problems are dealt with. Chapter 8 comes, now we're ready for victory. We're going to learn from our mistakes. We're going to fail forward. 
And if you fail, that doesn't mean that you're a failure. You know, that sometimes we have this complex. Oh my goodness, I've failed. I'm a failure. We see ourselves as somebody that can't, you know, bounce back because of the mistakes that we've made. But just because you fail doesn't mean that you're a failure. God has a plan for your life to bounce back and to become the man or the woman of God that God wants you to become. One of the misconceptions we have is that failure is avoidable. It's not avoidable. We're always going to have struggles. We're always going to have adversity. What we have to do is to bounce back from those struggles in order that we can move forward. Now notice this in chapter 8, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Take the whole army with you and go up and attack Ai, for I have delivered into your hands the king of Ai and his people, his city, and his land. It's a great verse right here. God gives Joshua the same command, but a second time. And he says here, if you're going to win the victory, you've got to deal with the junk in your past. For the Israelites, it was fear and discouragement. Notice what he says there. He says, do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. Did you know those are the two greatest enemies for you succeeding in your spiritual life is discouragement and fear. Discouragement and fear. And listen, the Israelites had a lot of reasons to be afraid. They had just suffered a decisive loss at the same city. Now they're going back to the same place. And you know those old memories had to be rolling around in their head. Man, last time they took us out. Those guys were bad. They embarrassed us last time. But Joshua says you have to let go of the fear and the discouragement if you're going to achieve the plan that I have for your life. And sometimes the junk that we have to let go of is just confessing sins to God or maybe even making restitution with people that we've wronged. It may be picking up the phone, calling somebody, apologizing. It may be uh, trying to resolve some type of conflict or trying to, to make some type of restitution for something that we've done wrong. But listen, when we begin to do that, we begin to position ourselves to go back and to succeed in the thing that we did not do well the first time. Now Joshua built on his past failures. The last time the troops attacked the front of the city of Jericho, only 3,000 guys went in the first battle. Now, Joshua has an improved battle plan. In fact, God has given him the battle plan. God says, set an ambush. So Joshua sends 5,000 men to the front of the city. He has 30,000 men behind the city. And this is genius. This is like so old school, classic, you know, battle strategy type, type of idea. But, but this works so well. The 5,000 guys run to the front of the city and they're like, you know. And they turn and run and all of the men of the city of Ai chase them. I mean, you know, you want to talk about taking the bait. The Bible says every man in the entire city ran after the Israelites. They were like, we beat them last time. We're going to take him down this time. Joshua took the past failure and he built on that. He used the same strategy but with a twist. And the twist this time was not just the running off. It was sending the 30,000 guys behind the city now into the city and they burned it to the ground and they won a decisive victory. It totally freaked them out. Now God did not give specific instruction. At the Battle of Jericho, God said you need to march around the city one time a day for six days and then seven times the last day, and you need to blow the, horn, the horns and the trumpets and the Ark of the Covenants there and the priests and the warriors and all this detail. God gives the specific plan. At the Battle of Ai, God gives the general plan. All He says is, set an ambush. Sometimes in our lives, God says, here's the specific plan. Sometimes God says, here's the general plan. But the principle is we need to follow whatever God says. Listen, if you're going to be a bounce back believer, if you're going to have a faith that overcomes adversity and hardship, you have to be the kind of person that hears the voice of God and follows whatever God says to do. So in chapter 8, it's setting an ambush. But they had this fear. They had this discouragement. And you know, the, the word fear comes from the old Anglo-Saxon term meaning to choke off. When we are afraid... The life of the Spirit of God is choked out of our lives. And we begin to fear 
feel fearful. And you know, worry is, sim is simply a misuse of God's creative imagination. Have you ever thought about this before? We spend so much time worrying, and worry is negative meditation. When we're worried about things, what do we do? We think over and over, well, what if she says this? What if they do that? What if this situation happens? And we spend so much mental and physical energy just worrying. Just, we bring some of the greatest creativity in the world when we worry. And God says, listen, if you're going to succeed, if you're going to bounce back from whatever adversity that you've been through, you have to be a person that puts fear and discouragement in their place. Discouragement is so important, you know, um, we, we need to have people in our lives that encourage us. We have to have that. We don't live in a bubble. We need encouragement. But listen, if you really want to be a person of faith, you want to have a bounce back faith, you have to learn to encourage yourself. You've got to learn to encourage yourself. Ryan, what do you mean? No, notice 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6, and David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because of the soul of all the people was grieved, and every man for his sons and his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. The Bible says David encouraged himself. By the way, he was going through some adversity. The people had turned against him. His family had turned against him. David was discouraged. He was running, hiding in caves, hiding under rocks in bushes, running all over the hillside there of the ancient world, trying to just stay alive. He was discouraged, but you know what he did? He, he, he encouraged himself. And listen, the way you encourage yourself is you get alone with God. You pray. You read the Word. You're reminded of the promises of God. And sometimes we sit around saying, oh man, I wish people would encourage me. I wish somebody would just call me and tell me what a great job I'm doing or whatever, and we feel sorry for ourselves. But you know what? To live a life as an overcomer, the life of faith, the life of power, the life of strength is the person that knows how to get alone with God and to get a word from God even when everything else seems to be falling apart. And that's what David understood. He encouraged himself. Fear and discouragement. I remember one time I was really discouraged. I was a college student. And I was, you know, an average student. I made average grades in college. I made A's and B's in high school and B's and C's in college. I did, you know, I was, I was average. I wasn't killing it. I wasn't magna cum laude or any of that. But I took accounting. Accounting, man, debits and credits, those about made me crazy. The first two times that I took accounting one in college, I actually failed. Did not make it. I took it a third time, I made a B. You know what I discovered? If you keep taking the class after enough times, you're going to pass eventually, right? I mean, it was amazing how much easier accounting 101 was the third time versus the one time. I also figured out another strategy. I had taken the hardest professor at our college. And if you take an easier professor, sometimes it's, makes life a little bit more pleasurable. But I took it three times. You know what? I took another class three times. I took Greek 101. I knew I was going to be a pastor. You know, the New Testament was written in the Greek language. And I thought, I ought to learn some Greek as an undergraduate. And so I took Greek, I took Greek three times. Greek 101. Man, it was, it was tough. I'm dyslexic, man. You can imagine what alphas and betas and zetas were doing to my mind, taking Greek three times. But you know what? If you get up every day and you go to class and you study and you take that class enough times, at some point you're going to pass. Sometime you're going to bounce back. And I just decided I was going to graduate and it didn't matter if it took me 10 times to pass that class. I was just going to figure out a way to do it. We have to have a bounce back faith. If we let discouragement and fear choke the life out of us, we will never achieve the plans that God has for our lives. That's why I love 2 Corinthians 5, 7. It says, for we live by faith and not by sight. Now, you know where discouragement comes from? It comes from the adversary. It comes from the evil one himself. He wants you to be discouraged. Because listen, if you're discouraged, 
You're going to be like that big plastic lump that I showed us just a minute ago, laying on the ground, not able to bounce back, not seeing that you can get back in the game and experience victory in Jesus Christ. You're going to just think, man, uh, this is all that I can do and all that I can accomplish. And the enemy has you right where he wants you to be if you're discouraged. And he is the master of discouragement. David encouraged himself in the Lord. I'll tell you, I was reading a book the other day by the author Robert Kiyosaki. He's the entrepreneur and uh, multimillionaire. And he wrote that book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Have some of you guys read that book before? It's a great book. It's a very famous, best-selling book. He has a great quote. And he relates it specifically to investing, but I think there's an application for us today. He says, I've never met a rich person who lost money, who, who, who never lost money. But I've met a lot of poor people who have never lost a dime. He's saying to investors, guys, listen, if you never try, if you never invest some money, if you never take a risk, if you never put yourself out there, well, that's exactly what you'll get. But you can play it safe and stay where you are and do what you've always done and hang on to everything that you've got. The same is true in the Christian life. God wants you to take a risk. God wants you to bounce back and to get back into the game. And this is what Joshua began to lead the people to do. But Joshua, we, we were defeated. It was ugly. It was embarrassing. How are we going to go back to that same place again and have different results? And Joshua leads the people and gathers them around this vision and this strategic plan. And, and oh my goodness, it was a stunning victory that day at Ai in Joshua chapter 8. You know, according to a Tulane University uh, study, the average failure rate of an entrepreneur that succeeds is 3.8 times. The average entrepreneur, they go out and they start a business, it crashes and burns. They go start another business, it doesn't get off the ground. They go try and start another business, it goes bankrupt. 3.8 times before somebody come, becomes very, very wealthy and successful. Listen, we have to be bounce back believers. I was talking with a really good friend of mine, pastor of a really large church several years ago. He said, Ryan, do you know my story? And I said, no, I don't know your story. He said, well, when I was in my mid-20s, I tried to start a church, and I was the pastor of it, and you know, we had some other guys, and it never got off the ground. We tried to plant a church, and it, like, it never happened. We never got more than just a handful of people thing just crashed and burned. I was discouraged. I was devastated. I, I was afraid. You know, I thought, what happened? Whatever. He said, but God called me to start a second church. And that second church is the church I'm pastoring now. And it's a church of 8,000 people. It's the largest church in South Texas. I said, man, how in the world did you bounce back? How, can you, how could you see yourself planting another church when the first church never really happened? He said, Ryan, it's all about learning from your mistakes and moving forward in faith. See, so many times we brand ourselves, we brand other people when we fail or we struggle or we have a heartache and we think, well, man, I'm just not good at that. Did you know sometimes you have to get some knots on your head before you can really achieve all that God wants you to, to become? No person is perfect. No scenario is without problems. But the way that we fail forward, the way that we accomplish the goals that God puts before us is we learn from our mistakes and we refuse to quit. And that's really what a bounce back faith is all about. For Joshua, he had to refocus. And notice in verse 2 of chapter 8, the scripture says, For I have delivered into your hands the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land, set an ambush behind the city. And that was the new game plan. Hey, last time we tried it this way, now we're going to try it another way. But more importantly, the loss at Ai was not just because of the poor military strategy, it was because there was sin in the camp. And Joshua says, man, we have dealt with that. Now we can go forward in victory. And God gives him words of encouragement, doesn't he? He says, man, I've already delivered them into your hands. You're, you're going to achieve it. 
You, you would look at the battle of Ai and you'd say, well, is that a victory or a defeat? The answer is it depends on how you want to look at it. If you look at it like the Israelites made some mistakes, they learned from it, and they came back and got in the game again and won, you would say it's a victory. If you want to say, oh my goodness, 36 people died, they should have won the first one, they shouldn't have made that mistake, then you say, oh, it was, it was a defeat. You know, a few years ago, they came out with the new Coke. The new Coke. I don't know if you guys remember that or not, but the new Coke came out. Coca-Cola spent all these millions of dollars to promote this. It was a huge, huge deal. And this guy by the name of Sergio Zyman was kind of the ringleader of the new Coke. And they had t-shirts and the Coke cans said new, you know, kind of on the corner. And it was, it was all hip and in vogue and, oh, it was the new Coke. People hated it. It was terrible. It lasted 79 days. Coca-Cola lost $100 million. Can you imagine that? This guy, Sergio Zyman, left Coca-Cola. Man, everybody thought, what a failure. Get out, you know, get out of here. What's wrong with you? The new Coke. And then they brought the old Coke back, and people went crazy. Several years later, Coca-Cola hired Sergio Zyman back to the company. It's pretty incredible. They lost $100 million. Now they're going to hire the guy that actually led them to make this decision. And somebody asked him, was the new Coke a success or a failure? He said, oh, it was a resounding success. And they said, why? He said, because when they brought new Coke, or they brought the old Coke, traditional Coke, back, the market share and the sales went far beyond where they were before they brought new Coke on. And so as they brought the old Coke back, the sales soared, and Coca-Cola made millions of dollars because they were the heroes. They got rid of new Coke and brought old Coke and made it new again. Isn't that amazing? You see, life is a lot how we look at things. What decision, what perspective are we going to take? Are we going to see things only as a failure, or are we going to see our lives as a constant narrative, a story unfolding before us where God is developing character God is developing perseverance. God is teaching us. God is developing us. Listen, if you only see your life as a series of wins and losses, you will be discouraged and frustrated. You'll live in fear. But if you see your life as one story that's unfolding and God is constantly bringing you and conforming you into the image of Jesus Christ and it's just a process and every decision is just a, a learning point for you along the way, then you'll experience victory and power and strength as the Israelites did in chapter 8. To refocus, we have to look at the Lord and find out what God says. And God said, take another risk. Get back in the game. It would have been so easy for the Israelites to say, God will go anywhere but Ai. Those guys wiped us out last time. But they did, and they faced their fear. They followed the word of the Lord, and they won a stunning victory. And God gave them the, gr the grace and the strength to do so. One was a covert night operation in chapter 8. Chapter 7 was a daytime attack. They were different. But they learned and they came back and they won the day in chapter 2. In chapter 8, excuse me. Um, Achan could have waited. The guy that sinned in chapter 7. You know, the guy that took the coat and the silver and the, the gold that was God's and he stole it for himself. Man, if he would just waited till chapter 8, he could have had 10 coats. He could have had all the coats that he would have wanted from Babylon. But he didn't wait. He wasn't patient. He said, I mean, I got to have it now. Warren Wearsby, the great biblical commentator, said, A realist is an idealist who has gone through the fire and been purified. A skeptic is an idealist who has gone through the fire and been burned. Man, are you a skeptic or are you a realist? Because a realist is an idealist that's gone through the fire, but their faith has been purified. Maybe that's what you're going through today, right now in your life. God is purifying. God is strengthening. God is reinvigorating your faith so that you can bounce back from whatever adversity may be before you. You may be wondering, man, is that even possible? You know, God's saying to you today, hey, you need to take a risk. Sometimes people say, you know, I went through a divorce and it was nasty and it was ugly. 
I will never get married again. I will never trust anybody again because that first marriage ended so poorly and it was so hard. Are you going to become a skeptic? Are you going to become a realist? Are you going to learn and grow in and through that? Are you going to say, man, maybe I did some things in my first marriage that I would do differently in the second marriage and I'm going to learn from that and grow from it and and, and, and now I'm going to have an intimate, dynamic relationship with my spouse, whereas before, maybe there were some things I didn't fully understand. What's the process? We learn the most about ourselves when we fail. You cannot have success without failure, and for some reason, we put so much pressure on ourselves because we think that we cannot fail, and yet failing, in many regards, is the very thing that teaches us what we need to know so that we can go on and bounce back and really succeed in all the dreams that God has for us. The question is not do you make major mistakes, but it's what do you do once you've been there. And the Israelites learned from it. They said, you know what? We can't have sin in the camp. We can't have selfishness. We can't have materialism. We can't have this kind of stuff. What we're going to do is we're going to worship the living God. We're going to do every single thing that He says. And when that happens, then we will be successful in all that He has called us to do. In verse 28, it says, So Joshua burned Ai and made it a permanent heap of ruins. They won the day. They won the victory very, very easily. They refocused. They reevaluated. They got rid of fear and discouragement. They took a risk. And they plunged forward and they did something great for God. You know, the Christian faith is a bounce-back faith. It's a bounce-back religion, if you will. Jesus was crucified he was put into the tomb, and he bounced back. He rose from the grave three days later. All of the skeptics, they counted Jesus out. Oh, this Savior, who? God says he's the Son of God. Who is he? Jesus was in the tomb three days, but oh my goodness. Three days later, death could not hold him. Sin could not leave him in that tomb. He overcame death. And he resurrected from the grave and he bounced back in order that you and I can have new life in him. And that's the most exciting news of all is that Jesus has risen from the grave. And because Jesus has risen from the grave, we can have his power and his strength infused in our life to help us bounce back and to overcome the adversity and the problems that we're facing today. That's why he's such an amazing savior. Maybe today you'd like to give your heart to Christ. You'd like to open your life to him for the very first time. The Bible says that Jesus was crucified, that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day. And that by putting our faith in him alone, that God can forgive our sins and make us a brand new creation in Christ. I'd like to just lead us in a word of prayer. And let's just bow our heads for just a moment. And if you would love to give your life to Christ and to, and to establish this bounce back type of faith, you could pray with me and say these words. Say, Lord, I know that I have sinned. Lord, I know that I've sinned. I pray you'd forgive my sins and that you'd make me a brand new person. I'm putting my faith in Jesus and what he did at the resurrection in order that I can receive new life in you. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.